Good afternoon. I'm Terrence Delianti, your police chief. I'm here with Meredith Hurley, uh, public health director. Good afternoon, Meredith. Mm -hmm. Hi, chief. As um, you know, and I guess the community probably has already found out that the president has tested positive and our first lady. So we wish them a speedy recovery mm -hmm. and um, hopefully um, that they can find out how they uh, tra <laughs> uh, contracted that COVID and, and trace those other people mm -hmm. um, to warn them. Again, uh, we're here to encourage and update the community uh, to comply with our public health um, requirements mm -hmm. and, and our COVID-19 protocols here on, a, on our local matter. Um, so I will turn it over to you to update the community sure. on our most recent uh, statistics. Sure. So as of, um, as of yesterday, which was October 1st, our total confirmed cases have been 404. Um, of that, 24 are deceased. Um, currently, 13 are isolated, and 367 have recovered. A very um, a, a metric that we've all been using and hearing about extensively in the last five to six weeks is something called our incidence rate. Um, and our incidence rate is a measure of risk within a population. And we use the incidence rate per 100,000 persons over a 14 day period, which can be kind of confusing. So the way to break that down is it's calculated by counting the number of positive cases in those 14 days, dividing it by Winthrop's population, which is currently 18,800, and multiplying that by 100,000, and then dividing by 14 to see what our incidence rate is. So I guess one of the comments I've, I've heard the most is why aren't we doing this by population? Mm -hmm. In essence, we are doing it by population. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just times that by the 100,000 that give Winthrop their own rate, mm -hmm. uh, appropriate rate. Exactly. Uh, I think the community is confused by the incident rates. I think uh, they think Winthrop, you know, you have 15 cases, we have uh, 18,000 people, uh, you know, we should be we uh, we leaving some of the restrictions. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be in red. Right. Um, so, I, I, can you add anything, any information to that? So, the reason why we use the hundred thousand, um, it's it's a way to standardize across all different jurisdictions throughout the Commonwealth, um, and throughout the country. It's it's just a it's a simple epidemiological um, standard that um, that will kind of allow us to compare ourselves to other communities um, so that we know where we're at. Um, and so it is 15 confusing. cases in Boston wouldn't put them in red. No, 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 15 no. cases in winter puts us in red. Yes. Uh, over the 14 day period. Um, so if the same 15 cases, is Boston doing it by neighborhood or is Boston doing it by the entire city population? Both. So okay. both Boston is doing it by um, their city. They just recently, as of Wednesday, moved into the high risk category as as a whole. Um, but they have definitely been tracking neighborhood specific incidence rates. Um, with East Boston, our direct neighbor, being one of has been for the last two or three weeks the um, the neighborhood with the highest rates of COVID transmission. Um, another way that I like to explain the incidence rate is, um, for example, you know, if our incidence rate is eight, which is what um, DPH announced, um, yes, Wednesday, um, that essentially would mean that um, you have an 8% risk of, of um, developing COVID-19 during that two week period. So I could say, you know, I have an 8% chance or an 8% risk of, um, of contracting COVID-19 during um, a two week period, so. And I, and I guess this week we have some fairly good news. Mm -hmm. We're down to we're down, eight. Yep, we're down to eight. Um, and I know that there are some questions about, um, because we announce every day what our case counts are. Um, and there's been three discrepancies that we're working through with DPH to see if um, it's something that I um, that I mistakenly didn't include or if they mistakenly included so that we can tease that out. Um, and I guess what I'll get into specific cases because mm -hmm. um, we would never do that. What are some of the categories that m shouldn't be included that mm -hmm. might have been included, I guess? Sure. If, uh, generalized. Yeah, and categories. this has been kind of through COVID in general. Since March, we've been teasing through um, with our contact in investigations and disease investigations. Truthfully, you know, where people are. Um, so 
so some, some reasons why we're, we're kicking people off of our case counts is uh, most recently college students that are out of state that are being tested multiple times um, on their college campuses. We've had um, a few cases of out-of-state students test positive. Now, they haven't returned to the community. They've been tested out-of-state and are isolating out-of-state, but because their address is still linked to their parents' address, um, it's being reported here, which is erroneous because DPH has actually come out with guidance saying that um, the jurisdiction where the, the student is living needs to be the one to obviously do the investigation and isolate um, and isolate them. I've also encountered um, folks that have been tested multiple times and each time they've been assigned a different ID number which um, because if there's one letter off in their name it the computer makes it believes that it's, it's a new case um, if there's one letter one number off in their birthday and we've also had folks that um, that recently had moved to another town that aren't living here in Winthrop anymore but they haven't updated their license you know when you go and get tested a lot of times people will either give their license or um, as long as you know as long as there's a phone contact or an email contact people are less concerned about you know giving their um, what their home address is um, so we've had a a few cases where folks had recently left the community or you know had um had I know early on we had those cases in March and April too mm -hmm. when we're in the EOC working through some of those problems so I guess because we have uh, such a focus on our numbers mm -hmm. and such contact tracing out of your office that we do we're able to catch some of these errors mm -hmm. um, that other communities are not catching yeah that's what I, I that's what I um, that's what my impression is and I think I think um, that the state is, they haven't figured out yet how to take those off necessarily if, if they're ones that we're bringing up to them in the past like four to five weeks. So um, we're working through that um, very closely. I know that you know you and I and Austin sit on a, a phone call every Thursday morning with the, the higher ups in the, the state um, in the state offices that are dealing with this and so we've talked with them about it. They're trying to figure out how to how to take you know just tease through it also. Um, so yeah, that's been um, that's been a question for a lot of people, and it's something that we're continuing to work on. It's not something that you know, and it could be. I'm looking for guidance from the state to tell me if it's if it's on my end, then I want to know why, um, and then I can you know let the community know where the discrepancies and why it's like that, okay. um, because one or two cases do make a difference here because our population is so small. Right. Um, but you know, I'm also very confident because we have such a low percent positive rate. We've had over 13,000 Winthrop residents um, so far tested. As of as of the 26th of September, we had um, 13,320 tested. So. In, in a population, according to the last U.S. Census, 18,000, mm -hmm. a little over 18,000. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so 13,000. You know, look at that. You say, hey, well, you know, 75 percent of our population has been tested, mm -hmm. right? But yeah. Some of those people um, don't live in Winthrop that have been tested at our site. Right. And mm -hmm. then other people in Winthrop might get tested multiple times mm -hmm. over the last five weeks. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this number is not, um, so this is the total number of tests of folks that use Winthrop as their address. Um, there's a more specific statistic, which I don't have access to, of, um, of how many individuals have been tested. Um, they don't yep. release that down locally. They do release it on a state level, but they don't, mm -hmm. um, they don't make it specific to towns just yet. So, okay. um, but what that means is, you know, our percent positive rate is, is pretty close to what the state, um, the state percent positive rate is. Um, but the, you know, and I think that what that means is, number one, that our community is taking advantage of the testing, which is great. And it gives me greater um, accuracy on the incidence rate and the case counts that um, that we're catching. You know, like the we're catching the cases that are um, that are in the community. So um, I'm confident in the numbers that we have. So where where our numbers are at right now is eight percent. Mm -hmm. But one household who is household spread mm -hmm. could easily put us back. Yep. Mm -hmm. Up and over 
into the red zone again. Yep. Um, so that's why it's so important to watch it and mm -hmm. monitor it for a 14 day period before mm -hmm. making any moves of uh, yes. releasing any of the restrictions or talking about any mm -hmm. further moves the town or the school may be making mm -hmm. in order to um, try to get us back to somewhat of a normal life here. Mm -hmm. Um, but understanding that, can we get to some of the, it, you know, I, do you still see a lot of household con, uh, spread? I am. Um, more recently in the last three weeks um, of, um, of seeing, you know, four to five people within the same address testing positive. Um, and so, yes, so it, a household is the highest risk that we would, ex we almost expect transmission within a household. Um, especially if there's kids, the younger the kids are, I mean, virtually if a parent is sick, um, a child is not going to be able to be taken care of by themselves. We have had, you know, excellent situations where um, families have, you know, had their children go and stay with grandma and grandpa or like the, that, but not everybody can have, has the means to figure that out. So. And, and it might not be the ideal situation depending on the health mm -hmm. of grandma and grandpa. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so, you know, we, I think in the last, um, in the last three weeks we've had, um, three to four households that um, have converted almost 100% to positivity within the household. So, so the, the, the spread is really still as contagious as it ever was. Mm -hmm. uh, we might have had have, uh, windows open during the summer months. Mm -hmm. We're able to get outdoors more during mm -hmm. the summer months, but this is still a very contagious uh, virus. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I don't think any of us sit in our homes with our masks on. So. Um, and I am a firm believer that the masks are um, are preventing, are allowing us to do this this movement of going to the grocery store and going, you know, going to a restaurant and like safely doing that, or you know, exercising outside, or you know, taking walks and things like that. Um, and then you know, our behaviors when we're in our house, we're not wearing masks because th that's that's essentially our herd, right? So like right. that's the herd of people. So. Um, so when you're when you're in your house, we you know, and even with some of the guidelines, which you'll hear us kind of talk about later on, is that you know, if you're if you're with people outside of your household, you need to be putting a mask on. Um, and part of that is because if you're with people outside of your with with people in your household, and one of them were to test positive the following day, it's more likely that that other person in the household will also because of the high rate of transmission because of the close contact, so. Um, so hand sanitizing, yes. still a high recommendation. Yes, lots of hand um, washing. You know, before you go in the store, after you come out of a store, hand sanitize in your car, mm -hmm. on the way out, grab some from the display that they have mm -hmm. on, on site there, and hopefully the, they all have it on site. Mm -hmm. um, as a It's a requirement of most local health boards mm -hmm. as well as the state COVID-19 guidelines for uh, sector specific yes. uh, regulations. Um, mask anytime you're in a restaurant mm -hmm. if you, until you sit down. Yep, until you sit down. Um, grocery stores, convenience stores, mask, mask, mm -hmm. mask. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think it's very important to reiterate what we've been talking about mm -hmm. since April. Yes. Um, to make sure everyone understands those are still the recommendations. Uh, how do you clean a house? We're talking about household spread mm -hmm. um, once it has been contaminated. Yep. What's the recommendations? Um? So most people are, um, if you're able to, you know, get your hands on some Lysol wipes and just, you know, the high touch surfaces. Um, we're more concerned about anybody sharing bathrooms or sharing um, like kitchen space because, you know, prepping food and things like that. So ideally, if if there is some one person in the house or even two people in a house that have tested positive. Um, and there's the opportunity to have just one bathroom, you know, that only the the positive folks use. That's that's best. Um, and we've had folks, um, we've had people that have tested positive that have essentially stayed in their room and you know had their family just drop food by the door, and which isn't which isn't phenomenal. Like it's not right. it's it's not an easy task for anybody. Um, but that's the best way to prevent spread within a household. And the people who don't have others to uh, help them or to take care of them or mm -hmm. to deliver them, they still can call the EOC mm -hmm. 
uh, yep. for, for that sort of assistance. Yep, they and, definitely um, can. Will, uh, police, fire, health department will mm -hmm. help rectify their issue mm -hmm. and get them what they need to yep. their house. Yeah. Uh, with uh, con uh, uh, contactless manner. So yeah, in a contactless manner. No contact uh, yep. uh, between the, the person who has to deliver and the person who is mm -hmm. inside infected. Yes. Um, so we mm -hmm. still are offering that um, to anyone. Please call the EOC. If they need more guidelines on cleaning or, mm -hmm. or suggestions, they can call the EOC. Yep. Or if they need um, cleaning Monday supplies. Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Um, and the phone number is the same that it has been, which is 617-539-5848. Uh, Great. Um, so let's talk about the, the, the latest order, Order 46, mm -hmm. um, Governor Baker's mm -hmm. order. Um, can we walk through that a little bit? I sure. know we've had some issues in Winthrop mm -hmm. on with some household parties. Um, obviously, uh, we had one two weeks ago. We had one again last weekend. Mm -hmm. And we really need to push the message out on uh, what Order 46 allows and doesn't allow. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to be um, fining people, no. but we will if we have mm -hmm. to. Um, but again, we ask for compliance through education and uh, having hopefully people uh, police themselves. Yes. And uh, of course, Halloween's coming. Mm -hmm. and it has me concerned me too. that we might have another uh, uh, spike mm -hmm. uh, because of household parties or gatherings connected to Halloween. Yes, same. So I. Uh, the governor's order number 46 has kind of become our Bible. We talk about it on like a, on a, um, on a almost daily basis. So um, the big points of the order is really around the gatherings, which is um, when they reduced it down. So for indoor gatherings, it is um, it can be confusing. The way that it's written, it says eight eight persons per, per 1,000 square feet on an in, on a um, indoor space so if you have a 2,000 square foot space you would have 16 people there um, if you um, but it cannot be more than 25 people even if you have a 10,000 square foot space you cannot have more than 25 people in inside um, of a dwelling and it does apply to public um, buildings but it also applies to private buildings too um, and then for the outdoor space it is the same eight, eight persons per 1,000 square feet of outdoor space um, not to exceed 50 um, and I know you have done some really good number crunching around because the yards in Winthrop are very small and um, and we're compact so and it this order specifically says it does apply to private backyards. Um, and so, um, you know, I know that you crunched yeah. some numbers. So um, we looked at, we wanted to educate the people and we wanted to put information out there that they can mm -hmm. feel that at least we warned them. Yeah. At least there was information about what the average size backyard is. So we looked at, through, with the assessor, um, we looked, Steve Roach uh, was kind enough to pull all that data compile it and tell us what an average size backyard is. Mm -hmm. um, so that average size backyard was about 2,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you times that out uh, over the, uh, you know, thousand, mm -hmm. it, uh, divide that by the thousand, mm -hmm. it gets about eight people mm -hmm. into, um, into a backyard. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, for eight, eight people per 1,000 square yeah. feet. Mm -hmm. So it would be 16 people total into a backyard. Uh, we're seeing parties that 30, 40 people yes. are coming out of the yards and the yards are not as not 2,000 square feet. Right. Uh, so that would be much less people can be in that yard. Mm -hmm. um, so on our Facebook page, right before we came on, uh, the Winter Police Department Facebook page, we posted that infographic mm -hmm. that tells us about the average size of the backyard in Winthrop and how many people would be allowed in that average size backyard. Mm -hmm. um, please take a look at it. Know the square foot of your backyard. If you don't know it, the assessor's office has it yeah. <laughs> uh, on their field card. Mm -hmm. uh, please feel free to reach out to them. And of course, if you need help um, with that, is call the EOC. Yeah. We'll be happy to get get a, get someone mm -hmm. to help you with yeah. that as well. Um, I'll, again, we'd rather educate them and help them find the answers that they need before mm -hmm. any uh, gathering is held. Mm -hmm. And so it's done legally. It's done with the safety protocols in place, and we don't have a big spike in spread. And you know, we I sympathize with those uh, the wedding up in Maine mm -hmm. that we saw uh, a couple weeks ago, you know, it was a, I think a 175 person wedding and the 100 and 
It's a super spreader 35 event now, people yeah. were positives yep. and, and multiple deaths, mm -hmm. um, and that's what we, we want to prevent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you raise a good point too that I um, I try to push out also. If you are having gatherings at your house, consider the way that you are entertaining. So, you know, um, not having communal food and you know, those are high risk behaviors. Like when we're talking about hosting people either in our house or in our backyard, you know, you don't necessarily want um, a bunch of like chips and dip around where folks are putting their hands in and putting their hands through their mouth and then putting their hands back in. We want to prevent that kind of activity going on. So just being mindful. So just so we don't become the chip and dip police, um, <laughs> you, you would suggest that they be put in individual bowls. Yeah. And yeah. people can pick up their individual mm -hmm. bowl um, so there's there's no five people standing around a small little bowl of, of chips and dip. Right. Um, so that, that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, think it through, mm -hmm. play it smart, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, divide those people. If you have an indoor event, highly recommend that we open windows. Yes. Uh, have cross ventilation mm -hmm. in, in those houses. Um, and you know, it's going to get tougher as winter approaches. Yeah. But I was watching last night on ABC News and they were saying and suggesting even in the winter months, Open, open them up during mm -hmm. the day for a period of time with yeah. cross ventilation yeah. um, to get circulation going mm -hmm. um, because the larger institutions, our schools, and will have ventilation, circulation yeah. going on, mm -hmm. but homes don't. Right. Um, so please, if you're going to have an event, um, if you have any questions, call us. We'll be yeah. happy to walk you through happy it. Happy to walk you through um, it. But let's we move like to questions. restaurants. Mm -hmm. and get sure. away from backyards and the house parties and let's move into the restaurants. So what has our local Board of Health authorized um, and what has the Order 46 authorized? Mm -hmm. Great question. So um, most recently, as of this past Monday, the governor has allowed for increased capacity um, within the restaurants, meaning um, we went from a table setting of six to now a table setting of 10. Um, and the governor had allowed for the opening of bar space to be used for seating. So um, we really are avoiding and saying that bars will not be open until um, phase four uh, because of the how congested they can be and just kind of um, the human behaviors that kind of come around um, bars. So this is, this is simply saying that bar areas can be used um, for seating where food service is also being um, delivered. So, um, and the Social food, distancing still needs to apply. Yes, so th you can have up to two people sitting together, but they have to be six feet away from any other two people that are also sitting there. And then um, if the bartender cannot be greater than six feet away from the patrons, there needs to be at least 30 inches of plexiglass in front of the patrons um, to separate the bartender, the staff person, and um, the patrons. So our Board of Health had opted to, um, to, um, to move a little bit slower, um, but as of October 1st, they've been able to move to the same, um, the same guidelines that the state had recommended um, opening on Monday. And we'll, uh, they have to have inspected mm -hmm. through the Commissioner of um, Inspections, Just, Al Lagee, mm -hmm. yep. in his office before they can actually kick that into full gear. Exactly. Um, and so let's talk about, I know this month ABCC, the Alcohol mm -hmm. Beverage Control Commission, has suspended multiple licenses across the state. Mm -hmm. And my reading of those cases, um, they have been because the manager was not wearing a mask, but socializing with people who are mm -hmm. sitting at a table mm -hmm. uh, in violation of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So they um, suspended that, that person's license indefinitely. There was another hotel in the western part of the state that was having a wedding, and they had two tents set up. They had 100 people in each tent in violation of the COVID-19. Mm -hmm. ABCC took swift action and mm -hmm. suspended their license. Um, so the ABCC is here in Winthrop with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we do check uh, periodically mm -hmm. these licensed establishments um, in order to help them help themselves. Yes. Uh, we, we try to get out there and educate them, mm -hmm. make sure they know everyone needs to be masked. Mm -hmm. There's got to be food service yes. with any alcoholic drink. Yeah. There's no one that can sit there and just drink. Right. Uh, regardless if they had food service already. Mm -hmm. It's food service with a drink. Once the food has ended, they allow them to finish that drink, and then that's it. Yes. Um, because the bars are still closed. Yes. Um, so hopefully, um, 
everyone here in the license establishment understands these regulations, understands the ABCC is taking this serious, mm -hmm. and we don't want them to get a suspended license because no. it's going to slow down their economic recovery. Right. Um, it's not going to help us. No. <laughs> if they're not, if they're they're suspended, it's not mm -hmm. going to help us on a tax basis. It's mm -hmm. not going to help us on a COVID basis. Right. So we really need them to make sure they're wearing masks, make sure their staffs wearing masks when yes. they're serving people. Uh, hand sanitizers available, uh, limit, um, if, if you're a person going out, I always try to limit my um, activities inside a public restroom yeah. because that's where you pick up a lot of germs mm -hmm. um, in, inside these buildings and the restrooms in general. So I think if they follow the guidelines, A, mm -hmm. they help us drive our numbers down, B, yeah. they stay open, their liquor license won't be suspended, and everyone's happy, and yes. that's what we're trying to get to. Yeah. For sure, for sure, yeah. So other state agencies that are helping us here in Winthrop, let's talk about um, yeah. who's helping you. Yeah, because we've, um, you know, the, the I guess the catch-22 of being a high-risk community and being in the red is that we do get additional support and resources um, directed towards us, which is um, which has been extremely helpful. So, um, in you know, Speaker DeLeo's office and Senator Boncori's office have always been very supportive and um, wonderful advocates for um, for our community, um, and we, the chief and I in Austin, Faison, we sit on a on a weekly call now with the Secretary of Health and Human Services. I also have a weekly call with the Assistant Commissioner of DPH. Um, we're also, you know, I know EOFs, the Executive Office of Public Safety, is supporting um, any sort of any sort of role of local law enforcement plays in in um, in the enforcement aspect of it. The Department of Labor Standards has been out in the community actually checking on retail spaces and personal care businesses such as barbershops and hair salons and nail salons. Um, and and you bring up a good point with them because a lot of these restaurants who are suspended, they have to actually submit a plan to the Department of Labor Services and mm -hmm. get their approval in order to reopen and get their license back. Oh. Um, so they're working hand in hand, mm -hmm. these state agencies mm -hmm. and with local communities. Uh, to make sure that, that that we're doing the right thing mm -hmm. here on a local level. Yep. Yeah. And um, and we also work with EEC, which is the um, Early Education. Um, I think it's the Early Education Commission. So they oversee a lot of the after school programs, the daycares, um, those that are not within the public school system. So, so. Uh, preschool, daycares, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And does a if a person wants to open their space up um, for Zoom school, school <laughs> uh, because a parent can't mm -hmm. be home. Mm -hmm. uh, does that fall under the e, uh, ECC? I think that so that actually falls falls under uh, the local board of licensing that they would have to modify their license okay. um, to reflect that they will be servicing um, servicing children and um, the the. The specific guidelines that come along with that in terms of how closely they would be sitting, um, consistent like masking, hand washing, things like that. And private schools, uh, not that a business is a private school, mm -hmm. but if you're opening in that fashion, private schools have more relaxed standards mm -hmm. than public schools. Yeah, yeah, um, and, they do. And, and we just found out uh, just before coming mm -hmm. on that they will actually are going to start releasing numbers, COVID numbers, mm -hmm. for hybrid model schools mm -hmm. and full in-session schools. Uh, do you think that's going to help or hurt us? Um, I think it, I think any sort of data is good. Um, you know, we're, we're all moving around so much more that it's getting harder to necessarily... I would expect that there's going to be positive cases of kids and staff identified throughout any public school or any private school or any you know secondary education um, environment it's whether or not it spreads within that um, it, within that um, classroom or that school that I think we're most concerned about we can our protocols and our procedures um, are built around the idea that there is going to be some sort of positivity at some point. Well, anytime you put 100 people anywhere, mm -hmm. um, it's usually 100, 120, 30 mm -hmm. kids per grade. Yeah. Um, you're probably going to have some type of uh, positive contact, mm -hmm. uh, a positive result on a test. Right. 
Right. Um, and you know, we see that with just a regular flu season. Yes. And how sometimes it rapidly spreads through through mm -hmm. the building. Yeah. Uh, this is much more contagious, mm -hmm. much more dangerous. Um, I, I know the school meeting was last Monday night. Mm -hmm. I, I know you were on it. Mm -hmm. um, are we still working uh, those protocols out with mm -hmm. the superintendent and the school committee? What happens is that that one classroom that has to quarantine, mm -hmm. is it the entire school, that grade? Yeah. Um, so I know different places are doing different things. Right. So we look forward to uh, having you back and, <laughs> and telling us and advising us before uh, we go back to school yeah. what the protocols are gonna be. Yeah. Um, because parents need to know um, mm -hmm. to have a secondary plan in place right. if that does happen. Right. And, and we want to make sure that we're, uh, I know the superintendent f feels the same way, that everyone has enough information ahead mm -hmm. of time before we move anything into a, the next stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and which, you know, do you think that, that the flu season and the COVID, uh, I, it's going to be just a, a, a horrible mm. clash of these two diseases? Um, during the winter months. Yeah, I mean, we're going to all be inside more consistently. So um, I have two thoughts. One being that flu is actually going to be, um, is going to be less of a burden because we're doing more distancing and masking and things like that. Also too, you know, we're, we're really pushing and we've had a, a, a much increased interest in flu vaccine here in the community, which is great. Um, so the more that we can vaccinate folks against flu, we're, you know, that's a good thing for us. Um, I think that the distancing protocols and procedures that we're doing for COVID will hopefully lessen the burden of, um, of our flu season. But on the same token, you know, um, it's not without, in, I, I, we had at least one case here that tested positive for both flu and COVID at the same time. So it does happen. Um, yeah. It's doubly miserable um, when it does happen. Um, so there is that, that option um, where it's not one or the other, it can be both. both at so, the same time. Um, so, you know, I do, it's yesterday, Yesterday, Massachusetts as a whole saw our, our largest increase of cases um, since early May, which... Um, not shocking. Not shocking, because right? the colleges Co and all everything. All the colleges are here now, mm -hmm. and they're all back in session. Right. Um, so we, we've actually added population, mm -hmm. um, and that's not taken into consider, considered when they look at the uh, population per the U.S. Census. Right, So right. it's the influx of population that's not considered in your factor. Right. Right. Um, per 100,000, right. uh, which is drives, drives the numbers higher mm -hmm. uh, when you don't have that population accurate count. Right, right. And, you know, we, we use 18,800 for each one of our incidents. Um, calculations are any population-based recording, um, and, you know, which is, is a number that UMass and um, UMass Amherst, um, one of their centers had used. And so that's what DPH's protocol is. And so that's what we're mimicking right now. Um, you know, but yeah, it is the, the accuracy of the population is very important. And um, the second most important thing is parents need to be public health ambas ambassadors. Yes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. People in college have high risk behavior. Yes. Um, they got to educate them before they leave and while they're there to please help us in Massachusetts. Yeah. Educate your child if you're from outside of Massachusetts, if you have children here going to mm -hmm. college in another state, help educate yeah. them mm -hmm. um, as well as to stay put, don't go yeah. to those parties, yep. wear a mask, hand mm -hmm. sanitize, yeah. uh, and all those good things that you've been teaching everyone <laughs> since March. Um, you mentioned flu shot. Mm -hmm. Where can people get them? So we're doing our first, um, we're doing a, our first flu clinic this um, this Saturday, but we're doing a series of them. So in the past, we've ordered about 350 doses of flu vaccine. Um, this year, I tripled that um, because of the the guidelines now and the requirement. I know it's going through the court system, but the requirement of the um, for children in the public schools to have a flu vaccine. So we're hoping to support you know the families here within um, within the town also if they want to get their child um, vaccinated for flu. Um, and so then, you said this Saturday, which is October third, just so if this plays yep, later, yep, people are aware yep, that we're Saturday. talking about October third, yep. and you'll have flu clinics uh, yep. continuing. Yeah, so you can call of, the EOC yep. for that information as well. Yep, because we are 
the first one that we're doing, because um, this is all very new and novel, is that instead of setting up at the senior center like we've done historically for the last umpteen years, we're doing it outside. Um, so we're doing a drive-up model mixed with a walk-up model, um, both at the same time. We're going to be offering intramuscular injections like the traditional and also the nasal, um, the nasal form of flu vaccine. And then we are you doing children? Yep, we're doing over the age of two. Over the age of two, mm -hmm. that's great. Yep, so we're doing over the age of two. Um, and then I did order, and it hasn't been shipped yet, um, the high dose vaccine for those over the age of 65. Um, I got feedback from a few different medical offices saying that they were not going to be holding their traditional flu um, clinics that they would normally do because they don't want the influx of people into their doctor's mm. office. So, you know, hoping to kind of that Mother Nature will smile on us and, you know, be able to get through the month of October. Um, realistically, we're probably planning instead of two to three flu clinics, probably more around seven to eight. Um, and you'll add them if you need to? And add them if we need to. And, you know, we're, we're also looking at doing pediatric-specific um, flu clinics um, that are a little bit more geared towards the kids. There's probably going to be lollipops or, you know, like some sort of um, more kid-focused. And then also for our older population, just anybody over the age of 60 um, would be able to come to their own flu clinic if they would like. Uh, parks, playgrounds, open spaces. Yes. Uh, has been a lot a source of a lot of complaints mm -hmm. uh, for people not masking. Yes. So the Board of Health passed an emergency order um, two weeks ago where anybody who is going to a park or a playground or an open space here in town needs to be wearing a mask. We have it's everything is is well um, marketed. There's signs everywhere all over these spaces. You know the Board of Health took the took this step to shut down McKenna Courts because um, there were a lot, there was a lot of crowding and unmasking down there. I know I myself have visited a few of the courts and playgrounds in the last week and handed out masks to kids in particular, um, you know, that are out and running around and just offering them a mask and telling them, you know, it's a requirement now, we have to put the mask on. Um, and it's gone well, the kids have been very open to it. Um, but yes, we do, and we do get consistent reports um, going forward. And you've just hired a health enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I, we just hired a COVID-19 enforcement officer, which um, is is really going to be tailored towards the re-education versus, you know, we want to use enforcement as a last step for folks, um, but we want to have a presence in the community. You know, um, I know Parks and Rec, for example, is doing a pumpkin painting um, a pumpkin painting program one day. So it'll be nice to be down there and, you know, offer masks for people. And then that that's time you get a block, you yep. get a call ahead, you yep. get to schedule your yep. time. It's not everyone show up at once. That's right. not going to be allowed. Right. It's not going to be allowed. And then this will allow us to have a, a presence down there of helping to like do all of the safe practices um, so that we can partake in something like pumpkin painting um, around Halloween and, you know, just to, um, just to sustain, you know, our mentality at this point. In that Thursday morning call with the state, um, they have also offered some assistance mm -hmm. to hook up with your enforcement mm -hmm. officer um, as outreach workers and mm -hmm. ambassadors, yep. handing out sanitizer and face masks yep. in these open spaces. Yep. So mm -hmm. it would be great uh, to see them come in as well, um, see everyone get masks and hand sanitizer that mm -hmm. needs it, mm -hmm. and to make sure our parks and uh, stay safe and our children and our most Elderly, elderly children, the elderly are the most uh, vulnerable mm -hmm. population in anything in law enforcement, and, and I see that in the same as public health. Yep, yep. Um, everyone on I the middle can almost fend for themselves, yeah. <laughs> uh, with some exceptions, yeah. but the children and the elderly can't, and that's what we're trying to do, yep, exactly. is make sure they have what they need, um, and they stay safe. Yep, exactly. Uh, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, um, you know, I think that, I think this community should be very proud of themselves as to, you know, I know that there's a lot of focus on the incidents and red and things like that, but, you know, our numbers are, are even our incidence numbers are coming down and the way that our per percent positive looks with it being 1.1%, you know, people are getting out and they're doing the testing. So, you know, we're able to isolate and then prevent the transmission. So, um, I, I'm very appreciative of all the, and even, you know, I was, I do see 
more people even just walking down the street with masks on, um, even not around people. I think it's it's we're changing our behaviors, and, which is great. Yeah, and I, I, I get a lot of calls on people with the person who's not wearing a mask. If they can social distance six feet apart, they mm -hmm. don't need it. Yep, yep. Um, we recommend it. Yeah, we just recommend we re it, right, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Um, Great. So thank you for all your hard work you and as well. uh, of your department. Uh, your uh, updates come out every day mm -hmm. uh, at the COVID-19 website. Yep. They can also go and see them yep. as well. It gets, gets pushed out by the town manager. Mm -hmm. So please stay informed. Look at our Facebook pages, uh, press releases on a daily mm -hmm. basis, as well as our COVID-19 um, website uh, that has all the important information. And thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thank you.